Welcome to Mindful Moments, Nourish Your Mind on the Go. This video uses AI narration to present our original book analysis. Today, uh, we're diving into Richard Dawkins' The Blind Watchmaker. You know, for a book about evolution, it really throws you in the deep end. It showcases just how intricate life is. Yeah, Dawkins doesn't shy away from that complexity at all. In fact, he uses it to set up the mystery. How could something like the human brain with trillions of connections or a bird in flight, you know, perfectly honed movements, how could that just happen? It really grabs your attention with those examples. You almost find yourself thinking, hmm, maybe intelligent design. But then Dawkins kind of pulls the rug out from under you. He does. What's fascinating is how he dismantles that intuitive leap, that leap to a designer. He argues that invoking a designer doesn't actually solve the problem. It just pushes it back a step. If life is too complex to have arisen naturally, then wouldn't a designer have to be even more complex? And then who designed the designer? It's just an endless loop. Right. So instead of relying on a designer, Dawkins presents this idea of cumulative selection. This is the driving force behind complexity. Exactly. He argues that seemingly impossible complexity, it can be built up through small incremental steps over vast periods of time. And he uses the analogy of a combination lock. Imagine a jumbled pile of airplane parts. It's as unique as a functioning airplane, but only one is complex because of its functional organization. So it's not just about randomness then. It's about those small changes being selected for yeah. and refined over generations. He actually uses a computer model in the book to demonstrate this, right? He does. Through repeated cycles of variation and selection in his model, even random changes can lead to surprisingly complex and functional biomorphs. And it's a compelling visualization of how this seemingly impossible process yeah. of how it can actually happen. This brings us to one of the most iconic examples in the book, the evolution of bat echolocation. He really breaks down how bats develop this intricate sonar system which is as good as, if not better than, our human-made technology. Yeah, it's the perfect illustration of cumulative selection at work. Think about it. Even the slightest sensitivity to sound reflections would have been advantageous for a bat ancestor. Over millions of years, natural selection would favor any variations that improved this ability, gradually honing it to the level of sophistication we see today. Okay, so we see how individual traits can evolve. But what's really interesting is how Dawkins applies this to the interaction between species, this whole idea of evolutionary arms races, right? That's right. A class a classic example is the predator-prey relationship. As predators evolve to become better hunters, prey evolve to become better at evading them. It's this constant back and forth that drives rapid evolutionary change on both sides, leading to some truly remarkable adaptations. It's like nature is constantly upping the ante, forcing each species to adapt or die. Exactly. Each species is a part of the other's environment, and they exert the selective pressure on each other. It's a continuous dance of adaptation and counter-adaptation. And then there's sexual selection, which Dawkins describes as another driving force for evolutionary change. It's not just about surviving. It's about attracting mates and passing on your genes. Absolutely. Sexual selection can lead to some of the most striking and extravagant features in the animal kingdom. Think peacock tails or the elaborate courtship rituals of birds of paradise. These traits might not directly increase survival, but they increase an individual's chances of reproductive success which is ultimately what evolution is all about. This whole idea of natural selection working over time to create complexity, it's so compelling. But what about the fossil record? Don't the gaps contradict the idea of gradual evolution? That's a common question. Dawkins directly addresses this in the book. He argues against those saltationist theories, the ones that suggest large evolutionary jumps in a single generation, even seemingly sudden changes in the fossil record. He explains these can be explained by gradual evolution occurring over relatively short periods. Geologically speaking, of course, we have to remember that fossilization itself is a rare event. So we're only seeing a tiny snapshot of evolutionary history. So the gaps might be more about the limitations of the fossil record yeah. rather than evidence against gradual evolution. Exactly. It's like reading a book with a lot of missing pages. You can still get the gist of the story but you might miss some of the finer details. And Dawkins argues that the details we do have point strongly towards the power of cumulative selection over time. All right, so we've got this picture of how Dawkins explains the complexity and the apparent design in nature. But before we move on, I'm curious about one thing. You mentioned how Dawkins also dismantles arguments for intelligent design. How does he address that? How does he address the fact that the idea of a designer seems so intuitive to a lot of people? He acknowledges that intuition, but he challenges it by pointing out that it doesn't hold up to scrutiny. 
He argues that complexity itself is an evidence for a designer. After all, we see complexity arising from natural processes all the time, from snowflakes to weather patterns to the formation of galaxies. It's like saying a hurricane must have been designed because it's complex. Exactly. Dawkins argues that invoking a designer is a cop-out, a way to avoid grappling with the truly awe-inspiring power of natural processes. And he presents evolution by cumulative natural selection as a much more elegant and parsimonious explanation, one that doesn't require us to invoke supernatural entities. So he's essentially saying that natural selection is the blind watchmaker that has crafted the intricate beauty and diversity of life on Earth. Precisely. And he backs up this argument with a wealth of evidence from fields like genetics, paleontology, and comparative anatomy. And one of the most powerful pieces of evidence comes from looking at life at the molecular level. Dawkins points out the remarkable uniformity of life when you zoom in that closely. What do you mean by uniformity? Mm. I thought the whole point of evolution was that life is incredibly diverse. It is. But underlying that diversity is this incredible unity at the molecular level. Mm. Think about it. The universal genetic code, the similarities in DNA structure, and the way protein synthesis works, it all points back to a single origin of life. So even though life on Earth is branched out in so many different directions, mm -hmm. there's this common thread running through it all. Exactly. And that shared foundation is a testament to the power of evolution to shape diversity from a common ancestor. It's like finding the same unique fingerprint at every crime scene. It points to a single origin, a single source from which all subsequent diversity has sprung. That's such a powerful analogy. It makes you realize that we're all connected from the smallest bacteria to the largest whale through this incredible process of evolution. It does. And Dawkins highlights how understanding this process helps us classify life in a way that reflects the actual history of life on Earth. He's a big proponent of cladistic taxonomy, which is a system of classification based strictly on evolutionary relationships. So instead of grouping animals based on how they look or behave, we're grouping them based on their shared ancestry. Exactly. It's like creating a giant family tree for all living things. And this perspective can really change the way we view familiar groups. For example, Dawkins points out that reptiles, as we traditionally think of them, aren't a true taxonomic group. Wait, wait, snakes, lizards, turtles, they all seem pretty similar. They do, but from an evolutionary perspective, birds are actually more closely related to some reptiles, like crocodiles, than those reptiles are to other reptiles. Birds descended from a group of dinosaurs that were also reptilian, which makes the traditional category reptiles a bit messy. So the way we've traditionally classified animals doesn't always match up with their evolutionary history. Exactly, and that's why understanding evolution is so crucial to accurately classifying life. It's not just about memorizing names and categories. It's about uncovering the deeper connections and relationships that exist between all living things. Okay, so understanding evolution helps us classify life in a way that reflects its history. But I know there have been other theories about how life changes over time. Did Dawkins address any of those? He does. He takes some time to debunk Lamarckism, the idea that acquired characteristics can be inherited. Oh, right. Like the classic example of giraffes stretching their necks to reach higher leaves and passing those longer necks down to their offspring. Exactly. Lamarckism was a popular theory before Darwin, but has been thoroughly disproven. Dawkins uses the giraffe example to illustrate why this theory is flawed and why the gene-centric view of evolution is essential. So it's not the experiences of an individual organism that drive evolution, but the changes happening at the genetic level. Precisely. The genes are the units of inheritance passed down from generation to generation. It's changes in those genes through random mutations that ultimately drive evolutionary change. Natural selection then acts upon those mutations, favoring the ones that increase an organism's chances of survival and reproduction. So it's this interplay between random genetic mutations and the non-random force of natural selection that has shaped the diversity of life we see around us. Exactly. And it's a process that's still happening today. One of the most striking examples of this is the evolution of antibiotic resistance, which Dawkins discusses in the book. That's a huge issue. The overuse of antibiotics is leading to the evolution of drug-resistant bacteria which is a serious threat to public health. It is, and it's a perfect example of how human actions can impact the course of evolution. We're essentially creating an environment that favors the survival and reproduction of resistant bacteria. So we're inadvertently driving the evolution of these superbugs. In a way, yes. And it highlights the importance of understanding evolution not just for biologists, but for everyone. It can help us make more informed decisions about things like antibiotic use, conservation efforts, and even agriculture. It's like Dawkins is saying that evolution isn't just some abstract scientific theory. 
It has real-world implications for all of us. Exactly. It's playing out all around us all the time. Understanding it allows us to appreciate the interconnectedness of life, the incredible power of natural processes, and our own role in shaping the future of life on Earth. Yeah, it's almost like he's urging us to see the world through this evolutionary lens. It's not just about understanding where we came from, but also where we're going and how our actions shape the future. Exactly. He really drives home that point, that evolution. It isn't something that happened in the distant past. It's ongoing. It's shaping life on Earth every single day. And it is a humbling realization. You know, we tend to see ourselves as separate from nature. But the blind watchmaker really emphasizes our interconnectedness with all living things. It does. And it challenges that whole notion of humans being the pinnacle of creation, like the ultimate goal of evolution. Instead, Dawkins presents us as just one branch on this vast and ever-growing tree of life. It's a perspective shift that can really change how you view the world. But I think what makes The Blind Watchmaker so impactful is that it doesn't just present the science it also tackles these philosophical implications. Absolutely. He doesn't shy away from the big questions at all. You know, he explores the meaning of life in this evolutionary context, the role of chance and necessity, and the awe-inspiring power of these natural processes to create complexity and beauty without a guiding hand. It's almost like a spiritual experience. Even though it's grounded in science, you come away with this sense of wonder and appreciation for the sheer ingenuity of life on Earth. I completely agree. Dawkins just has this remarkable ability to convey these complex scientific concepts in a way that's both accessible and engaging. And he does it with a sense of passion and wonder that's truly contagious. I think that's what makes this book such a classic. It's not just a dry textbook on evolution. It's thought-provoking. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, a hopeful exploration of life's grand narrative, a story that can really change the way you see the world and your place in it. Absolutely. And if this deep dive has piqued your curiosity, we strongly encourage you to pick up The Blind Watchmaker and explore Dawkins' fascinating arguments for yourself. You can find a link to purchase the book in the description below. And don't forget to subscribe to our channel for more mindful moments. We're diving into a new book every week, so there's always something new to discover. Thanks for joining us on this journey of intellectual exploration. Until next time, keep those minds nourished.